Sweet. I'm going to drop off. We'll hand over to George talking about application consent persistence for the good and bad. Over to you, mate. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can't hear me. Ah, oh, what a setup. Um, thank you for staying to the very end. I thought I would have just my little private cheer squad up the back and then a, a couple in the front. So, well done. You all deserve a round of applause. And don't worry, my talk is not one that requires heavy brain work, so uh, it's perfect for the end. <laughs> so who am I? That's me. I uh, went to Nalu Station and the sunset was awesome. I was so happy I took a picture of myself. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm just a, a regular guy. I work for Empire as a senior consultant uh, doing cybersecurity stuff for them. And I like trying to go outside and camp and fish. And I'm sometimes a champ at Rocket League if I play enough. So I wanted to talk about application consent because it seemed like I was seeing it in quite a few of the incidents I was managing or the blogs I was seeing as a means of um, maintaining persistence in customer environments. I had to actually work out what it was first and how uh, it could be used or unintentionally create scenarios where it could be used. So that was the idea for the talk. Uh, application consent basically allows programmatic access into your environment. Normally, you know, a user would have to log in to an account. Um, and you know, uh, we're, we're probably quite familiar with the uh, process of assigning permissions to a user account, but this isn't necessarily assigning permissions to a user account. It could be a service account and it could be permissions much more privileged than what a, a user would normally get. So uh, it's programmatic in nature, it simplifies integration and it's used with single sign-on. It's, it's bigger than I thought, but it's probably still a bit small, the text, to see up the back. This is an example of me signing into GitHub on my iPhone using my GitHub account. So it's my account and it's my phone, but I'm still giving permission to the GitHub iOS app to act on my behalf. And, and that's so when I open up my phone, I don't need to type in my username and password, do my two-factor authentication. It, it just, I open it, it has the permission saved. All right? And having a look at the permissions, it's, it's actually quite, um, it's, it's, it's the whole account. So to put it into context, if someone knew the PIN number on my phone and stole my phone, they've now got full access to my GitHub. Good luck to them, there's nothing useful in there, but I mean, <laughs> they'll still get it. Having a look at the other side of this, um, this is looking inside GitHub, the permissions that the application has been granted. All right, so this is the, the sort of uh, permission like a regular consumer would be using uh, with a consumer service. But it, it applies equally the same in your corporate environments or in your enterprise. And, you know, it, it, it may well be them using your, uh, their personal or their, their work email with Office 365 signing into monday.com and granting full access to their mailbox. And if you're looking after your environment, you might be concerned, unless you've done a full risk assessment on monday.com. And every single other application your users have the ability to consent to allow their data to be used within. So here's my Google account signed into my Mac. Right, do you know when you're in Mac, you've got, oh, maybe some of you don't, but like you can go into the accounts and put in your Google account, it has access to your calendar, your mail in the mail app, calendar in the calendar app and some other resources. And, and it's just another example how my Mac doesn't need me to log in for me to use my Google resources. It's, it's been consented away. My Mac is now me for Google. This all works using a thing called OAuth. OAuth is an open standard used to provide uh, authorization for resources. It uses uh, whatever authentication protocol the identification provider uses. So I've shown you two different identification providers. GitHub is an identification provider and it's using OAuth to consent to the GitHub app. 
Google is an identification provider for my Gmail, and that's consenting to the Mac OS to use it, and OAuth is the mechanism. OAuth's great because it's uh, secure, it uses HTTPS, so that's all the stuff that James was talking about this morning. It allows it to be safe. It's an open standard, so you can implement it across many platforms or any platform. It doesn't stick to any one programming language operating system platform. There's three types of tokens that are used based on the type of um, process that it's got. First of all is the access token. It's the simplest one. An access token is given uh, immediately after an authentication. All right, so that access token is used to authorize based on whatever permissions the uh, account has been granted in that system. Now, an access token is only short-lived. Speaking in Azure AD, because that's where I live, if you're looking in uh, uh, Auth0 or many of these other authentication providers, there's more capability, but the principle is generally the same. Access tokens are short-lived, like 60 minutes long. All right? Uh, but the, with an uh, access token, it's kind of immutable. I say kind of, there's, many, there's always you know, ways to split it, but if someone steals your access token, they can be you and have all of the access that you have. Um, but it's transmitted securely, so it, that they would have to you know, steal it some other ways. Um, or they'd have to dupe you with like a fish, get your credentials, then they can log in as you and have an access token. The refresh, uh, a session token, it's a bit like a, a cookie. Like, uh, it might grant an access token and a session token at the same time for a web service. And the access token um, and the access token is less important because the session token could be whichever defined session length. And then once that expires, uh, you need to re-authenticate. And then lastly, there's the refresh token, which is beautiful. Has anyone noticed that you might only need to log in every 90 days to a lot of the web services, Facebook, Twitter? Yeah, that's because when you sign in, it gives you an access token for that immediate session that you're currently in, and then a refresh token, which lasts for whatever has been defined by that service. When your access token expires, it uses the refresh token to give you a new access token without re-authentication. All right? There's a bunch of services. This is, th these are actually um, identity providers, but they all use OAuth. Uh, this, is, this is the login on the Epic <laughs> Games Store. I mean, it just felt easy because there's you know, lots of colors and lots of providers, but they all allow you to use your account with these external services to register and log in with Epic, right? So Epic doesn't necessarily have to maintain their own, although I'm pretty sure that at the very top they also have their own. So, what's the big deal? So if you're consenting to an app, or if your users in your organization are consenting to an app, you're, you're hoping that they're only consenting to low risk, low privilege apps, right? So that's sort of like read-only permissions. You can still steal a whole mailbox with read-only, but they can't delete the mailbox. <laughs> I don't know if that's better. Um, so typically, you only want to allow a user to grant access to low-value resources, maybe their own personal calendar. A lot of the time, you'll find but uh, it's whatever they have access to, they can delegate access or uh, consent to, give to another service. So if it's a, an executive assistant in an organization with access to 10 mailboxes, including the CEO, then maybe that person's not so low risk, even though their job function doesn't have uh, privilege roles, it's got sensitive information behind it. So uh, it's, it's always a risk assessment activity. Don't just make assumptions. You've got to have a look at this stuff. Here's an example of a very high important low risk uh, app consent. <laughs> Uh, it's expired, and I have deleted it out of my Facebook. I don't actually know if I ever used it, um, but my friends told me I could get a free shake if I had the app. <laughs> so basically, uh, all this did is allow me to log into the Hungry Jacks app using my Facebook account. All right, and you can see the permissions. Uh, all it gets is my profile picture and my name and my email address. And you know, I'm in so many of them dumps that go around uh, that my email address is, is no longer private. And if you were really clever, you'd probably be able to guess it. So, eh, low risk. 
Maybe you can't read it. That, that would be good. So what does a high-risk app look like? Uh, you know, maybe permissions are scoped to the whole tenant rather than just to a single user. Maybe an administrator has done the application consent um, rather than uh, an unprivileged user because then that application can retain administrative privileges, which can be quite scary if it's like a global admin signing off and stuff, and I've got a good example next. Um, and you know, like if the application can then manage other applications or manage users, then that has potential to be a bit scary. Here's a, a program, like the, the, the fun thing, does this work? Oh look, see these green ticks? That means someone sufficiently authorised has said, yes, you can have access to this whole tenant. All right, and then if you have a look at the, uh, you know, application read directory, read all groups, read and write all groups so they can um, manage it, can manage uh, all, manage access as a user. Like pretty much all of Exchange is, is, is owned, but that one, can, consent required, no, but it's been granted anyway because there's this button which is really easy. Rather than individual granting, you can just grant all and do the one click. But basically, this is meant to be high permission. It's for a Veeam backup, VM backup for Office 365. They need to get everything, right? Um, but the way it's set up, it still has a client secret. And if a bad guy got that client ID and client secret, maybe out of a poorly configured VM agent, uh, then they've got that access, all right? It's, it's wonderful. Uh, Script-based logins, Cairo was talking about stuff around this yesterday. There's a lot of environments where you cannot manage um, the way connectivity is put in or uh, maybe the uh, vendors being, you know, has bad or lazy security practices, but essentially you can register a, an application in your identity provider. So I'm always thinking Azure AD. And then you assign permissions to your application, and that way you can automate when that script runs. And you just put in, well, you shouldn't, but most people do, just put in the credentials in the file. Um, you know, you've got to protect it like it's your password. Well, that's easy to read. So like, we've got three variables on this, right? We've got the client ID, which is like the, the username in this instance. We've got the tenant name, which is like the the, uh, the place where that username lives, and we've got the client secret, right? And then this is to make a Graph API connection, which is the back end of all of Microsoft 365. So you generate a token, and then you basically send a web request with that, um, that information, and, and then you're authenticated. So you've got an access token. That's what this header is, all right? So this, this is really straightforward. I mean, I just pulled this off out of the Microsoft docs. I'm not really great at programming, but I'm bad enough to be dangerous and and you know like I started off leaving these things in here and that's bad right and and there was a talk a couple of back where they uh, where he was talking about um, putting it as an environment variable that's infinitely more better um, but ideally you would probably at least in Azure use a managed identity or key vault to sort of keep your secret safe because uh, this application couldn't do much, just manage the whole team's tenant for a state government organization. But I promise you I did change the client ID uh, and the secret, I actually went and just generated them with the right amount of digits. Uh, I don't know if it's the right format, but uh, that won't work anyway. Um, and you know, that tenant might exist. Anyway, so don't try it. So what can go wrong, right? If you consent to an application, then you're trusting that application. All right, it's as simple as that. You're saying whoever wrote this application doesn't want to do harm. Installing this application in my environment and giving them this permission means I trust the application. And if you give it broad access, then you're trusting it an awful lot. Scripted tasks, you know, it, uh, back in the day on just on-prem stuff, it was pretty straightforward. You'd have a service account. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time, you can still do a similar thing, but you just need to uh, try and obfuscate and protect your passwords, right? Uh, so, and, and, and use the, the services that help you keep your stuff safe in, like if you're using an Azure function, you can use a key vault. So I've got some hypothetical examples. 
Um, well, only one, really, because I was asked to be quick. Um, like, what, what happens if an attacker gained access to a, a sufficiently low privileged account, but it could modify an app principle? Because there is an Azure AD role called uh, Cloud App Administrator, or it could be, um, you know, they've managed to somehow get a privileged account and they're modifying a low privileged app, but with that app they can create themselves a secret. And once you create the secret, it obfuscates it in the system. So you've got to copy it. It's annoying as hell because if you forget, you've got to delete it and create another one. Um, so you create the secret and then you go to the API permissions and you can just say, you know, um, everything and consent. Um, a lot of the time, if, unless you've got like, you know, enterprise grade licensing, you are not going to know because there's, there's no logs. I mean, there's like audit logs, there's the unified audit log in, in Microsoft, but I don't know how many people sit there, I mean, Bex might, but like there's not many people who sit there watching this log source, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, I am a complete Microsoft shield. There are products that you can buy and easily use to do that. Um, but, you know, maybe your SIM, if you've configured it properly, would have it. Um, but I, I know before December last year, many, many organisations did not have it. All right, but SolarGate um, showed us that attackers were using this as a really valid method for persistence and uh, elevated permissions. Um, I can't remember what month it is, but we got this uh, nice uh, communication from you know the three and four letter organizations talking about um, an attack where um, uh, the Russian GRU uh, was using Kubernetes instances which they had automated uh, to do a global attack on Office 365. Um, and basically they were just looking to, um, you know, maintain persistence or exfil. And, you know, what I'm talking about fits in right here, right? And, and low privilege is, use, like, I've, I've given that out just to my phone, you know, like, because I read email on my phone. So it's, it can be, you know, a bit scary. Fortunately, um, you know, we can do things like if it's a username and password, you can put multi-factor authentication in, which is much safer. And if it were a, um, if it were a service account, uh, you can, you know, put conditional access actually on a service account and say it can only run from certain places or do certain things. So how do you defend it? Basically, you are, there's this one really good toggle switch which says that your users cannot consent to applications, period. But that might, that might uh, upset your users who want to be able to um, use their 365 account with Instagram for whatever reason. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's a, a, a link there. But like my point being, like a user will want to uh, sign in with their work account many places that you've just, like, why? So you can turn it off, but you know, if you're not completely draconian, you can turn it back on and, and limit it to really low value permissions. So uh, like my Hungry Jacks app, right? So they can share their email address, share a picture of them, enough so that they can log in. You know, LinkedIn um, integrates well. You can log in with your work credential. It doesn't really pinch much info. Microsoft already has it, I guess, but like, um, <laughs> You know, that, that level of access, you can make it so they can do it without having um, any further uh, impediment. And then if they do try to uh, consent to their data being put into another app and one of the permissions falls outside of what you've allowed, you can have a, a consent flow. And essentially, um, you nominate someone when you're setting it up uh, as the, per the Porsche mark who has to go and review all of these ones. But like, it's better than just allowing anyone to have access. So it, it may uh, be ticket driven, however you want to integrate it, but they'll go in to um, AD portal or MCAS and review it. And they can do a risk assessment, which is what we should be doing. We don't want to block users from doing everything. We just don't want to block them from doing, st we, we want to block them from doing stupid things. It depends on the user army. I mean, I'm glad I don't support you, but like, <laughs> maybe if you used a Canon camera. <laughs> um, and if you used, uh, 
if you have got a CASB, uh, you can use it to monitor it because it, it, everything that goes over your HTTPS with your accounts uh, can be tracked through it and you can set up rules. So even if you, you don't want to go through and set up the constraints, you can still set up um, policies in your CASB to watch what is going on um, and then just go have conversations with people. Uh, wait, I've got more. All right. Um, yeah, make sure you've got sufficient logging. I've heard this a few times. Seems common sense to me until you've got to buy storage or pay for cloud storage. Yeah, so it's not easy. But make sure you're logging like important things. Marty, I'll send you the slides. So you don't need to. <laughs> uh, and and if, you've, if you have got the logs and you're putting it into a sim, then you can also create an alert to match the sort of thing that you're looking for, right? Um, more importantly, make sure you're logging certain actions, like if a new application is registered, log it. If a client secret is uh, changed or added, log that and generate an alert, yeah? Because these are signs that uh, someone's trying to maintain persistence in a covert way, or, you know, the password's gonna expire in a month and for a change they're changing it before they get a support ticket that the service isn't working. Um, and yeah, if you can use conditional access, it's, it's super powerful. I don't know how many orgs are not in 365. In my day job, everyone is, because I work for Microsoft Partner. But if, if you have got conditional access, use it. It is so powerful. And you can block quite easily. If you're a developer, practice the principle of least privilege. Don't ask for more than you need. All right, it's easy to just ask for everything because then everything works. But then you're sort of opening up your org to a lot of risk. And use a key vault uh, or obfuscate your secrets in such a way that it can't just be lifted up and pinched. Right. I'm being cheeky. <laughs> I just can't let this opportunity go by. I mean, I don't know about you, but... Uh, <laughs> they put me last and I was quite happy about that. It was a surprise part because I'm lazy and I didn't read the whole email. The email was so long and I had to click the button in Gmail to show the whole table and then I had to scroll like three pages to find me. So I thought, hey, I'm, I'm, um, I'm the lock note and I put it on Twitter asking and Nigel kindly responded, thank you, uh, and he said he prefers the cl uh, closing keynote uh, and someone else who is rather sneaky, responded and, and told me that I might be the tail talk Charlie. <laughs> uh, but I did put it on Twitter if it's the lock note and I had a resounding seven votes that said yes. <laughs> and we all know Twitter is the source of truth. So uh, here we go. Um, very smooth, thank you PowerPoint. Uh, I promise you this is like three minutes long. Um, so basically, for those of you who don't know what a lock note is, it's like a touchy feely session to round up a conference so you just feel good about yourself, especially if you felt dumb because you didn't understand most of the topics. But um, I don't think that's anyone here. The dumb people ran out of stamina and have fled uh, looking for more donuts. <laughs> right? So congratulations everyone again. And honestly, all I'm going to do is recount my last three years of coming to, well, four years, but, you know, well, you'll see. But, like, you know, this was my first B-side, and I was a bit shy. I only did two tweets the whole weekend. And the first tweet was about, you know, food, because if anyone knows me, food. Um, and the second one was I was just amazed at the badge. I'd never gotten such cool loot at a tech conference before. All right? And honest to God, uh, coming to this conference was transformative for me because it's the first time I saw like a valid career path that I might be interested in because I was at a real doldrums. I mean, I'd been working in the TAFE teaching. It was great, but I'd kind of reached some limits. So I was like, well, what can I do? And then I came to B-Side and I saw, you know, heaps of cool talks. Uh, I loved watching the, the VP of Silence watch his product got bypassed, you know, immediately after he had it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, learning about Wiggle, like, uh, my eyes were open the whole day. It was bloody awesome. All right? And then, you know, building on that strength, the next year I almost won the inaugural and prestigious Australian Cybersecurity uh, Professional of the Year. 
almost. And I know I'm not alone here. There are other people who are, like, who else was here and was a finalist? Don't be shy. Look, yeah, we've got a few people. And then I was really lucky they let me run a workshop. I hadn't been teaching for a little while. Um, so I did do a, a workshop on uh, Raspberry Pi and made a little hack tool, which was fun. And I met some really cool people through that workshop, uh, including Guile. Um, and, you know, like from that B-sides, because I was a little less shy, I met like a bunch of people I got to meet in and I got to join the ComfyCon crew. Uh, if you don't know about ComfyCon, it's your loss because it's awesome. Uh, I got to meet Bex and a handful of other people, right? It's, it's been uh, super good. I was so keen for 2020. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then we came to 2021, and, and that was yesterday's first tweet, um, which was awesome. My, this is a great conference, and uh, I, I don't believe uh, we should underestimate like how good and how much of an impact it has on our community. And and like you know, for me, I, I, I think because in part because of B sides, not completely. I'm going to have a little bit of ownership of my own destiny. But attending B sides really did present a new perspective. All right, so I I'm now have a satisfying role in, in cyber, and I'm included in an awesome community ComfyCon, uh, and B-sides, I mean, we've got people from all around Australia coming in. Uh, every year when Nigel announces the date, I block out my calendar because I want to come. And I think I was like the first ticket buyer, but I think he was just teasing me. Uh, and <laughs> I was, I was 8.56. Or well, A57, and the first purchase I had to refresh, but I was keen. And like, maybe not getting the first ticket because I'm going to fire you every year, but like, learning and, and, and having your perspective shifted is an opportunity sort of open to anyone who attends. You know, so if you're thinking about a role in cyber and, and you're not quite there, or maybe you're in one part of cyber and thinking I'd like to try something different and you haven't, like, just have a go because you've got like all of these people who would talk to you about it. All right, so it's awesome. So, thank you. Thank you to you three. Thank you to all the other red shirts. Um, they're the coolest red team I know. And uh, thank you for listening to my talk and indulging my second talk as well. So thank you very much.